I'm Stacy and I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm Stacy and in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thanks, Stacy. Um, yeah, I'm I want to stay with the um, triangle and keep developing it. Um, and I'm sort of very aware when I'm looking at the triangle that I've, um, which I have not paid that much attention to compared to um, the pendulum, for instance. Um, I think Pellant's just almost probably known for the pendulum more than anything else. Um, so I, I don't quite know the right word, but just in terms of transparency, um, I guess I'm a bit, I don't quite, as I said, I don't, I don't quite have the word, but yeah, this is not a tool, this is a tool that I am in fact unfamiliar with where some of the other tools are literally inside me, you know, they're just there. Um, uh, the, we talked last, um, on Sunday about accepted efforts and rejected efforts and particularly the part of rejected efforts where um, we are trying to turn them into accepted efforts and we talked about gimmicks. Um, and when I think about how we've taught the pendulum over literally what is half a century, um, I guess I want to have some of the same sort of looseness uh, coming at it from a lot of different angles um, that about this work, um, particularly the part of it that I'm looking at today, which is <coughs> um, and it, it, so I, I guess I just need to ask you to be a bit patient with me about all the. So Peter, I just want, Peter, I just want to interrupt because I think, am I right in thinking that we ran out of time to do much about gimmicks, which are so useful for people? Uh, other people chip in. Well, no. Am I, am no. I wrong about that, that we covered gimmicks? I thought part of the reason we were continuing because we hadn't spent much time on gimmicks. Yeah, we're going to do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, but mainly today I want to get at that. <coughs> I don't know how the diagram comes along when I hold it up, but the... Okay, the triangle starts here with an effort going towards the goal. Um, and I, I will take up what Mary said and go back into it rejected efforts, but I want to get at this side of it as well today, partly for me, because um, I, I guess I have in my head the sort of clear image of these two very simple diagrams um, that can, can convey a great deal. And we have done that with the pendulum. We've just done it. We can teach it in all sorts of different places. We can teach it to psychiatrists as an alternative to medication. And we can teach it to kids and teenagers. You know, this can help you not pick the wrong boyfriend. Um, so, but I, I, I don't have that almost hands-on familiarity with this bit. Um, I don't think in any way that changes my approach to it because, you know, the, I think hardly anybody thinks of 
the pendulum without thinking about memory links, um, without thinking about true rest. Um, uh, so I guess there are sort of almost clusters of tools that come in. Peter, just, can I just jump in and say, I, I would like to frame this as it's a real a privilege to be with you as you do developing some of the theory. That's not an experience we often have. Okay. Well, <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much. And, and I am, I mean, I'll sort of hold it up. <laughs> um, that's, my, that's my writing today that, sorry, Vic. I just have a very quick question. A moment ago, you said something about uh, something being an alternative alternative to medications with regard to psychiatry. Was it the pendulum was the alternative mm. to medication? Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Can I just add that for some people it needs to be a support to medication. Like, uh, you know, I had people try, I was transparent when I was working in a mental health uh, drop-in centre and one person went off medication to copy me because I was transparent, I hadn't used medication. So you, you can't quite just say, excuse me, Peter, but it's a little, uh, you have to be a bit more careful than just saying an alternative without adding stuff, just because, of, you know, like for my um, stepdaughter, for example, uh, she, she didn't, I tried to teach her the pendulum, but she didn't apply it enough. And if she came off her, every time she came off her medication, uh, she went completely crazy. So it does oh. depend on the level of application and uh, severity of the condition. Yeah, that built into the material. Because yeah, because I want to blow things up when I'm off my medications. Yeah. And, and we I say, I mean, it's very, when I take very them. and in terms of, okay, what you said, Mary, was well, taking a compliment while, yeah. um, but the impellent, which is the name of the organization, you know. It's not, Pellin is not following David Pellin as, uh, with any um, uh, guru. Yeah, yeah, David Pellin didn't want to be a guru. That's true. Um, he was very, very clear about that. And, uh, I'm a student of his, I'd say, uh, more than a disciple. We want to sort of move away from that, the esoteric, which I'm not attracted to, um, although I respect and I, understand, I absolutely know that it's a direction where a great many people <laughs> get their purpose. It's not what, Pellin, not what the organization called Pellin is. Um, and, and in terms of what you just said, Mary, you know, our first priority is safety. Our second priority is safety. Our third priority is safety. If someone gets something useful out of it, fine. And that was where, Vic, go on. Yeah, so you'd have to get a significant buy-in. Like I'm, I'm dealing with someone, and I know all of many of you have much more, you know, you have therapeutic and counseling experience, which I don't have, but I'm dealing with someone in those kind of situations, you'd have to get buy-in to the concept of, uh, of uh, pendulum for it to actually work, especially to the degree uh, that a person could get off meds. And in my opinion, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to get buy-in with someone who's already disturbed is a pretty hard thing. I mean, there's huge defense mechanisms. I don't have a problem, right? You guys are the problem, right? Mm. Um, so I don't want to distract us, but I'm, I'm curious. No, 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 I, no I, I, can, I can bring this in because bring it into the triangle, okay? Because um, the triangle is about the part of life where we're we're moving ahead because we're doing things. It's a simple part of it. So if you're going to work with, and I, I just threw it out quickly, is these different applications of the pendulum. 
um, that that's in the background, any, any of those activities and say, and I said very specifically, teaching psychiatrists that there's an alternative to medication. I have never said teaching patients this is an alternative to medication. I wouldn't go there. And that's just my personal, and this has nothing to do with Pellon uh, at all. This is just my personal ethics in my field of work that safety comes first. So if someone's, if someone's taking medication and it's not within the foreseeable future threatening their life, which is a different situation and which it could be, if you, I mean, um, you know, you don't, um, you don't take away anything unless you've got some pull back, um, ever. Um, but it's a different thing to be training a group of psychiatrists and saying, hey guys, you might be on the wrong track and we might have something very powerful here. And this should change people's lives. And in that situation, there's no question of safety. I mean, they've, in England, they all live in, um, I'm a bit mocking of, they all buy vicarages, okay? Consultants, I guess a lot of senior doctors in England like to buy vicarages, because of course, the the vicarage is the lovely big house that sits next to the church where the clergyman used to live but the church they're so big the church can't um afford them anymore so it's a guy i always think of consultant psychiatrists in the vicarages okay but it's a different thing to engage with them passionately and saying we've got something that's an alternative for some people to medication. And then you have whole questions, particularly in America, more than in England, but even here it's the case, the political power behind the pharmaceutical company who produce a medication. Now, that's a very different debate than saying to someone who's having trouble hanging on, uh, give up your medication and study the pendulum. I don't think anyone in Pellon in half a century has ever made that statement. Uh, so I just, I just wanted to- No, th that. thank you for that clarification. I, I, I did forget that that was the context you've mentioned and, and I'm really mm. happy you uh, picked that up and expanded it because it makes so much sense. I, I just kind of, just memory link flashed on it because it was a real issue for me about my transparency. I wanted to say how much pen in tools had helped me and I didn't want it to be unsafe for people. So it was a, yeah. a real struggle. So I'm sorry about the diversion, everybody, but I hope, no, no, I hope no. it was interesting anyway. Yeah, no, because I, I think it's useful because, you know, this is how the work's developed over all these years and which have been used in a whole lot of different situations. Um, and I have never, I mean, I've worked in prisons, I've worked in um, with drug addicts and alcoholics, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, and I've developed uh, safety methods over all those years, but I've never, un until the last 10, eight years, I've not worked in a field where safety is such a concern as it must be with foster children. So all it is, that sort of simply made all the stuff I've been saying about safety um, for years and years very relevant. The history of my stuff about safety um, came out of what is in some ways the other part, the other half almost of the Pellon program and um, contribution training, and that is Gestalt therapy. And within Gestalt therapy, they, including the founder of Gestalt therapy, Fritz Pearl, 
they really lost it in terms of safety. That's why I came down on it so strongly. Um, you know, it wasn't, safety was never a problem around David and he didn't need to talk about it really, uh, except in how it was inherent in the um, material. Inherent because, you know, he called his work a philosophy, I call mine a set of tools. Um, bringing yeah. all, yeah, go. Um, I have a thought about the triangle. Uh, is now an okay time to uh, mm -hmm. ask about it? So I'm looking at this triangle and, you know, the peak in the middle, I've called in my head the decision peak. Um, and I'm thinking about how important it is to make small goals for or and how that could have changed certain aspects of my life in light of the decision peak because here's how I'm thinking about it and tell me if I'm off track the example in my life I'm thinking about is my business degree um I set off to get my business degree and the goal was a four-year degree and so you know all my effort went towards that and I did not evaluate until I had reached that long four-year goal and when I discovered that it wasn't giving me a job because my health had fallen apart while I was getting to this goal. That was a huge drop from which I have not recovered. You know, I'm looking at that downhill slide and that's how it feels. Having taken a huge downhill drop to square one. And, you know, I, there will probably be a day where I use that degree in some form. But had I had the luxury of making smaller goals and doing frequent evaluation, you know, perhaps every term even, then I could have changed direction or made necessary modifications and possibly kept my health because I wasn't pushing so hard towards one goal and not looking at what it was doing to my life. And so decreasing the height of the decision peak by making the goal smaller and therefore making the effort shorter, I think is, can be really important to mental health for people who need to stop and evaluate more often. Yeah. And that's my thought. Thank you. Now that, that a really important point and really useful to me because what we have in fact taught evaluating in terms of hurt and purpose before this, okay? So I can do, because what I want to be able to do is bring evaluating in terms of hurt and purpose in really alongside the triangle really early. And I think you're right. I think it sort of needs to be some sort of image that, um, you know, can sort of expand and contract, you know. So there is some uh, continuity in, um, in, in the evaluation of goals process. Some continuity in the evaluating and setting of goals. And again, I'm sort of drawn into that from my political sort of side, because in another place, uh, in 
when, when I'm teaching sustaining purpose, I talk about, you know, the great universities of the world, uh, bazaars of sustaining purpose for the children of the privilege, so they can go there and shop around for all these goodies, okay? Um, and they can change course because they've got all their privilege behind them. Um, and that's why I want something fluid in which, which we have achieved between the pendulum and memory links. Um, something fluid in the triangle between the triangle and evaluating in terms of certain purpose. Mary. Can I come in, Peter? Thanks. Um, I remember that uh, Vic brought the triangle in, you know, quite a few forums back, and maybe he can add to what I'm saying. And what I liked about the way Vic mentioned it that time was about going round the triangle in a direction to, you know, having little goals on the way. That wasn't the phrase he used. And why I liked it so much is that because I, my life was, uh, um, my, being productive was completely undermined by my extreme mood swing. When I started getting healthier, I had to have small goals because I didn't know how to be a responsible adult. And um, I, I guess I was self-aware enough from the over-optimism and enthusias enthusiasm and fantasizing of compulsive highs that you get in that kind of uh, mania and in inverted commas. To, to realize I couldn't do it that way. I couldn't do it by having big goals. I had to do it by having really small concrete goals. And so I'd always experienced the triangle in the way uh, Vic introduced it that day as, as like literally going round, uh, well, how I imagined it from what Vic said was, you know, making a goal, going round and making another one. So you kind of gradually got towards the big goal and, um, I, I, I that really built my self-respect you know if, if you kind of can't achieve anything because you're fantasizing and you can't achieve anything because you're depressed it does a lot, it does a lot of bad things to your self-esteem and using the triangle that way without knowing I was uh, meant that each incremental taking responsibility or keeping a promise or taking action whatever the incremental things were uh, really built my uh, sense of uh, worth back up. Mm. Yeah, what, what, I, uh, what I distinctly remember uh, David teaching, and as we've mentioned many times, and Peter has certainly said that uh, David could reach out and touch you, and he had an impactful way of teaching. And I remember him, uh, you know, emphasizing that um, too many people are goal oriented, and we needed to learn to be direction oriented. And, uh, and, and, and that once you reach a goal, well, then there's a goal is a point <laughs> on direction. And he said, we should try to be more conscious of the direction. And again, go around that triangle again and again. And I, I believe somewhere, uh, and again, Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought David said that this was happiness that this is what happiness really is, is going again and again, whether it's small or big. Now, the only thing I want to comment on, uh, and this is kind of a confession in a, in, a, in a way, I mean, David taught that, and as we've said many times, the common sense-ness of his teachings was so powerful, and yet I have to, I have to confess, I can, and I don't really think that, I think we, let, we beat ourselves up, we're not at the goal yet, or we just disallow uh, feelings of accomplishment because we're not at the goal, the goal yet, the proverbial goal, right? And I think that that's a problem. And, and again, that's why the tool would be so important to try to understand. And I, I still feel after all these years, I've got, I've got to learn something about this myself. But yeah, he taught too many people are goal oriented, we need to be direction oriented, and a goal is a point in another direction, and that's all it is. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Cynthia. Um, 
actually, the, this made me, uh, the whole triangle, I started thinking about it last week, um, but as people have talked to me, particularly after uh, Elizabeth uh, talked, um, it made a lot of sense. It, David Pellin may not have wanted to be esoteric, but I have found as astrologer, particularly classical star, a lot of his ideas, I've been able to plug right into things that I've learned. And one of them is, a, and this triangle, uh, I think fits uh, into a very basic concept, and I won't go into astrological jargon, I'll go how I teach in astrology is based on the seasons. Um, if you're living in a four, uh, a place with four seasons, uh, the beginning of a season starts with a huge amount of activity, and then the middle is um, is sustaining. You just keep going, um, and then and then it and then you get into a period where uh, at the end of the season you're just getting ready for the new season. Um, and I was a little thinking about valuation. How would that fit? I said, well, it seems to fit. The t other two legs fit perfectly. I was wondering how evaluation fit, but when um, Elizabeth talked about it. The natural progression once you start is to keep going, but that evaluation of hurt and purpose, deciding whether this is really a goal that you want to keep going at once you've started, because you can you have a vision before you start of what you want to do, but it doesn't always turn out the way you want it. You might want, and instead of just, you know, and and different people are better at the starting phase, different people are better at, you know, the letting go and doing something new. And there's some people who get stuck in the um, in the middle phase of just, you know, continuing the effort and continuing the effort. And that's that stopping and decisioning. I mean, there's been, I've had many, many things in my life that I've, um, even now where, where I'm like, why am I keep doing this? <laughs> you know, is, is it, is it something that's really getting me towards anywhere? Is it just because it's habit or, or stuff? But anyways, I, I just brought that out, particularly as it's in development um, that, uh, uh, I don't know. I may I may be wrong. That this may not be a correspondence, but it seemed like a correspondence to me. So, yeah. No, I, I really appreciate you saying that. And my, I need to find a way to say more of what I'm about and not what I'm not about. Okay. Um, and that that sort of memory links. You know, that's my. Um, uh, Australian insecurity, you know, uh, Australians going of my generation, I think I mentioned it here, have what used to be called the colonial cringe, okay. Um, and I know there's a certain, when I was relatively young and went to California, um, and wow, I mean, I, I really feel my sense of confidence came from my time in California. They have a confidence Australians don't have and English people don't have now, in my view, have once. That's it. They're, they're my memory links, okay? So one, of, one of the things that we do is put the author's memory links in as part of the examination of the material. Um, anyway, so the whole idea, so I'm, what, what I'm struggling with, let, let, let me make it practical first. I can always do that. Even, even this, you know, I'm struggling in this, with, with this a bit. So, hmm, could slip into a rejected effort, okay? You know, watch my pendulum, you know, see if you can have a bit of control around your words and bring it back to the topic. Um, assessing goals. Um, that's almost a demonstration of a use of the tools. Um, and I think there is something about assessing a goal that we have reached or assessing a goal that we have not been able to reach. Because sometimes we simply need to, maybe there's a reason that we cannot, and, and there's something about the word gimmick that's got a particular sort of flavor for it. It's, you know, a bit, um, 
haphazard and coming from the outside. So, you know, and yet within a creativity, you know, we try all the creativity we've got. We bring things in from, we try to bring things out, things in from the outside. We try to use gimmicks and it's still a rejected effort. Maybe that is a goal we need to drop, okay? And one of the things I want to do with the triangle and I want to marry, on the one hand, yes, we need small triangles. And if we're looking at mental health or times in our life when we cannot function, um, then we need, to, I think the triangle is a very useful tool in you know, not having huge goals, having small goals, assessing our goals. But one of the things I, one of the biggest things I got from David Cohen, this is personal, was scope. You know, I'd studied economics, I'd studied social work, you know, I'd studied mental health, all these things. And this guy came along and he was taking on everything, okay? And that just gave me something. And it's still with me today. You know, I can, I can bring Rembrandt into this discussion, or I could bring Hegel into this discussion, or I could bring, you know, foster kids who are being moved because they're going to their 14th foster family. Uh, and there's something about the scope he had, simply what he took on. So within that, I want to say, yeah, in terms of, you know, the pendulum, and I said the things I'd said about the pendulum earlier, stuff we're saying about the triangle here, you know, being careful about those goals. But I still want us to, you know, the writing I was doing today on this topic was about, yes, you know, and it's, a cliche, but it's a cliche that works. That a journey of a thousand miles south with one step. Okay, good stuff. But the purpose and the authority, it would have been finished the journey and done the thousand miles. So there's something about this work, particularly today, yesterday. Um, I don't want it. There's something about the medical mental health model that to me can be restricted. That's why I bring in the political stuff and the historical stuff. You know, what, what about the young girls who want to dream of being the vice president of the country? Okay. What are those trying to like? What are those? Um, uh, point of developing purpose about. Uh, what are their pendulums about? Because one of the things I've done with a pendulum is found the absolute necessity and I would say human glory in some really compulsive highs. You know, without, some, you know, because the mental health model can take vision out of stuff. Sometimes we need it. All of us, you know, you can miss out on life by just being in the middle of the pendulum. Or you could miss out on life just going around sensible triangles which, within which you are not going to get mentally ill and you're not going to fall on your face and you're not going to look stupid. But you might never reach the heights of which you are capable. Um, and David always said, which I took as a point of freedom, you know, you're working with the population you're working with. So he was working with dropout kids in the main who maybe were just out of jail, were headed to jail, could easily go back to jail, could easily go, go back to um, drugs, crime, you know, that was essentially his core population. 
you know, Fritz Perls and um, Sigmund Freud's core population were very established, very um, well off professionals. And it's my belief, and you know, we all develop, uh, I call it the seminal population we work with. Um, you know, Dave's and my similar population were very similar at that time. Um, so yeah, you know, compulsive highs are really dangerous. Um, teach them, uh, Mary. Um, that's, uh, I, I just wanted to come in with two things that uh, one's, uh, anyway, I'll just say them. So I was going to say about the small goals thing, it's so important in the recovery movement uh, and in 12, you know, in giving up drink or in giving up controlling behavior or doormat behavior inside Al-Anon, it's very common to say, you know, there's a whole book called One Day at a Time uh, inside Al-Anon and it's very common to say, oh, I had to go one hour at a time, I had to go one minute at a time you know, in giving up whatever the difficulty was. Uh, on, on the next point you made about, uh, you know, needing the dreams, um, I read this wonderful article in the New York Times, I think it was, I'm not sure if it was there. But anyway, wonderful article about this little girl of about eight, a Latina little girl, who um, I don't remember where, but, but was uh, met in person, um, uh, Chief Justice Sotomayor, I'm not quite sure how to say her name, and um, the little girl asked her something like, told her she wanted to be president one day or, or asked how to be president or something. And um, it detailed the transcript of everything that the Chief Justice has said, which was completely validating the dream. There wasn't a word of uh, 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 of um, saying that would be difficult or it can't be done or anything like that. Not saying she would be, but just encouraging her to, if she had that aspiration, to, well, just encouraging her to dream big. And I, yeah. it was very touching. So that's where bringing this in, I want the triangle to be a tool as the pendulum is within which on the one hand, people who come from a um, severely underprivileged background can use to find and make opportunities and use them. Um, for people who are struggling with social or mental illness can use to recover, get their strength back. But I also want it to be um, coming from a different side as well just people who have been fortunate enough to have privilege in their life, whether those privileges are emotional or financial, uh, to dream. Um, and we've got that in sustaining purpose, but my task is to connect the tools up so we can say, Okay, there's a survival level of using the pendulum, but there's also a risk-taking level on using the pendulum. Yeah, if we take David's and my seminal population, help, you know, we've got to teach these young people not to take risks. It's a really bad idea. Uh, you know, uptight established professionals and business people and wealthy people you know freud and pearls had to teach him how to take risks not how not to take risks um so it's the adaptability of the triangle it's the adaptability of um assessing um Going back to Elizabeth's point, you know, what are the moments of assessing, okay? And true for me, okay? I, I can have big dreams, but 
I've got a relatively short period of time. So what is the assessment of my goals going to be? It's not going to be the same. I'd be a bit bonkers if I was assessing, and sometimes I can go there. Um, if I was assessing goals as if I was 40 years younger, you know, as if I was 46 rather than 86, very different very different assessing process of the goals. So. Peter? Yeah. A um, couple of quick thoughts. Uh, first of all, I'm thinking that what you were saying is why we evaluate in terms of hurt and purpose rather than just hurt. Yep. Because, you know, in the purpose is the use of the big highs, the use of the big goals. Mm. Um, the other thought, and I have to get this out before I lose it because I almost lost it. Ah, uh, yes. The thing is, setting the tiny goals I missed a word there. Actually, oh, sorry. Setting smaller goals? Yeah. Am I reasonably clear? That sounds a little bit staticky. But maybe someone oh, else dear. is getting it. We, we found out that that was a trouble. We couldn't make go completely away when, we, when the, Cynthia and Elizabeth and I were talking. This is about the best we okay that's that's fine we'll just say it say it slower and more than once <laughs> all right um making smaller triangles gave me permission to take the risk of going in a direction when i was afraid to start and so you know even with a big dream, finding that too intimidating was a very real situation for me. Mm. But taking the small triangle in that direction and giving myself permission to assess gave me the permission to start going. No, yeah, no, thank you for that. I think it's really important. And you know, I am, as you know, engaged in um, the continuation of the civil rights movement, to put it very flat. <laughs> um, and I think in terms of big triangles or small triangles, if you take John Lewis, who grew up really poor, 11 kids, I think, sharecroppers, um, and if you read his autobiography, they, they were small triangles, okay? And he stayed, he almost stayed with the small triangles all through his life, which is interesting. He built on them, but okay, we're doing this one sitting, we're doing this one bus ride, okay? Um, and he turned that into a huge power. You know, Dr. King, on the other hand, was an aristocrat. You know, he was born into the um, prince. It wasn't, they weren't called prince, aristocrats, they were called princes. You know, he was born, in the, born, in, born into this very established um, black upper class religious group. So he could have the big, the big triangles. But in his autobiography, John Lewis said he always had to have the small triangles. So maybe that's another point of assessing the triangle. Um, you know, whether it's big or small, I think, because I think what we've achieved with the pendulum, it is seen as a tool. It's seen as having no answers in it is what someone does with it, all that sort of stuff. Um, 
And I think we can do that with this. So I think there's a real debate about big versus small triangles. Um, the the um, great um, Greek writer, Kassanzakis, I mean, I'm quoted here before, who's best known for his author, the Greek. Um, you know, he wrote, he, he wrote some essays as well as novels, and there were sort of monologues almost, essays. And he wrote one about this, you know, young man who was a carpenter and he had some unusual experiences and he had sort of unusual thoughts in his head about God. So he, um, you know, he found a really good therapist and the therapist helped him get rid of his delusions of grandeur and Jesus was a very happy carpenter. Uh, that's always been an important one for me, okay? Um, you know, there's, that's, that's why, I mean, just going over to the other, that's why I like the, um, the life forces and the interlocking circles and, and combining those, the connections, combining those with, um, which is a point of assessment, um, combining those with evaluating in terms of certain purpose. Because it's not, you know, someone's got hardly any caring life force, you know, that just might mean they become Michelangelo um, rather than a happy Renaissance family man. Um, it's the, I guess it's the breadth of human experience that we want to get across and the, the tolerance for that. And I, I think, you know, big goal, big triangles or small triangles, I sort of like that. I think that's a, I think it's a sort of cool way to talk about it. Peter, I was just thinking about Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling on his back, very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. was a huge goal. And if he hadn't had, you know, I've got to paint this space or I've got to fill in this robe and like had a series of, I don't know if I like the metaphor of big and small triangles because I like the idea of the triangles repeating and going in a direction. But however, leaving that to one side, if he hadn't had triangles that repeated about the small section he could see, he would have given up or gone crazy. I mean, he just used this tool for perfection, didn't he, to complete that huge task? Which he did not want to do. He wanted to be a sculptor, he didn't want to be a painter. He thought painters were um, really second rate compared to sculptors. He didn't <laughs> want to do the Sistine Chapel. The Pope That's is funny. the Pope. The Ninja Turtles were named after the painters, Michelangelo, and I forget the other three, Michelangelo and three other great oh, painters. Are you Donatello, Leonardo, and Raphael. That's uh, right. Okay, okay. And we taught the, our, our preschoolers were playing Ninja Turtles all the time, and we taught them, do you know who those guys really were? <laughs> and then we taught them about art. Oh, wow, well done. Yeah. And they got on their backs and they painted like Michelangelo in the loft. We got in the loft and we put butcher paper over the loft on each side of the bars and they painted like Michelangelo. And they said, This is hard. The paint's dripping <laughs> down on us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a lovely story. Yeah, Cynthia. Well, I've got a problem, and in fact, it's been a problem that's been on my head at just as a personal level, is, is that I've got too many triangles. <laughs> I've got, I want to, you know, I, I have a big one, which I'm developing a, a branch of astrology, a new branch of astrology, which is kind of, you know, one of those delusion ones I, I worry about, but I'm going for it anyways. And then, you know, I want to make a living. I want to have established practice. I want a house that looks somewhat decent. I've got a garden to deal with. I've 
what relationship and I somehow want to get back to my Japanese. <laughs> so I've got all these little triangles that are like all over the place and it's making me crazy because I can't do them all. <laughs> well, that that's where, you know, one of the things that evaluating in terms of thought and purpose comes in. And that's where the, you know, the body of knowledge is really comprehensive. Because that's part of what we call strata and forget I mentioned it because it's another pretty big body of work. Um, but it's setting priorities, you know. Um, and some of our stuff about in a different place on setting priorities comes from work that's about time management, coming from a whole different field. Um, you know, certain exercises you can do um, to, to set priorities. Um, I, I, I think that's something we should get some... Um, we need a reading list, don't we, Mary? So we've got to get a reading list. I think I've been avoiding the reading list. Had one once, haven't had one for a while. Um, but there's something about that that, uh, you know, is a sort of expansion of evaluating in terms of hurt and purpose. Um, so we can, yeah, really, really work out what's important for us. Um, I think you can Google it fairly. I think. I can't remember the author's name. I used to use this stuff a lot, but I'm sure the book is called Time of Your Life. Um, and it's just sort of classic time management stuff. Um, did we do that in Italy way, way back? Cease? It was an exercise like, Make a list of the things that are important to you to complete in the next two years. Hmm. Uh, if you, we didn't, I don't think so, but I like no. the idea. Yeah, that, that, yeah, not being mysterious about it. We, we, we could even do it here one day, Mary. We could put it on the uh, agenda. Just, just to say, there's a particular way you do it. And it's um, what do you want to in in what do you want to complete over the next two years? In other words, make a list of all the things or the things you would like to say in two years' time. I have done that. Okay. And then then the next one's a bit harsh. Um, imagine you've been told you only have six months to live. Make a list of make a list of the things you want to achieve, and then the third one is make a list of you. You know, assuming you're going to have a long, long, healthy life. At the end of your life, what are the things you'd like to do? To um, you'd like to be able to say you've done. And then you go through a particular process of prioritizing each of those lists. And then you come up with a sort of compilation. We, we could easily do it here one day. Um, we will. Because you cease. I was going to say, I really like that idea uh, for myself because I think about things that I'd like to do. And I know at 71, I don't have another 40 years. Uh, but um, <laughs> but breaking it down into chunks, like for the next two years, I think that would be great. You know, I have like a hundred books I haven't read. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to get through them all. But maybe let's say I'm going to pick out five or ten or something that that might be on that list of one of the things I want to do mm. and make it a little bit uh, not so stressful for me. And this really, and I sort of really appreciate that the conversation's gone in this direction because I had literally forgotten about that part of my work, okay? Um, uh, you've got to be a bit careful because it is, there's some parts of this work 
That, that exercise, by the way, is called the life goals exercise. The life what? Life goals exercise. Oh, okay. Yeah, Mary, at one time it was simply called the Palin life goals exercise. So it was quite routine. Nikki's not here today. I imagine one time she's done it. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it, as long as you get the safety right, it's fun, okay? But there's, we've done a lot of work with art therapy and some of you know that going back all the way. Um, life goals exercise, art therapy, and something that's a bit technical called an awareness continuum. They are things where you have to be concerned about safety. Um, of course, one person in 50, 100 is going to get into a hard space if you don't set it up right. Uh, so, in, and we have a lot of exercise, in terms of safety, we have a lot of exercises around the middle of the pendulum and being quiet and if you finish an exercise before anyone else, you know, don't don't get into chatting because we have a whole, um, going back all the way, that the most important person is the person who's most vulnerable. Um, and at times that was not part of, well, not part of good soul therapy. Uh, it took too many risks. I'm a good starter. Yeah. Sorry. I'm a good starter, but not a good finisher. I've got five novels started that I'm writing and they're in my head and I'm not sure where to take them, but I can do two pages a day on one of them. So that's my commitment. That way I'll eventually finish them. Yeah, that's also uh, from, cause I'm the same. Um, but I'm older than you, so I've got more than five. Um, <laughs> Um, that's a place where it's really important to have good advisors and be able to listen, passive listen to what the advisors are saying. If they're giving you hard feedback, it's need to find hard feedback. Um, and as Mary knows, I don't always handle those situations well about my writing, okay? Uh, see, sorry. Yeah, I wanted to say something about that. I know in um, in the uh, psychodrama and the Gestalt work, whenever we're doing something hard, we always have uh, we always do a little talk with our, let's say, our guide or our sponsor or somebody that we trust, and we do a little talk with them about how they're going to help us with this thing, and be sure we have those in place before we start something, you know, so I might start with talking, if I was gonna do this about, um, my friend Marjorie might be my guide, because she's somebody I trust and always has good, so it would be different for different people, but it's nice to have, you kind of feel them right beside you as you do the exercises and you can even check in with, you know, there could be a time to check in using gestalt or whatever, that two-step thing. How, how, is, how is it going? So that's mm -hmm. something we use that I think is um, really helpful. That's always planted in first before we do anything. That's, this doesn't sound terribly difficult, but it could be, you know, so you never know, like you say, you never know what's gonna hit. Mm. And uh, it's always nice to have that person, that being or whatever with you. Yeah. No, I really appreciate that, Cece. As we're developing the online training course, I'd really like to use you as an advisor on that because, um, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of my work, a lot of my work in the sort of seminal years and the developing years, um, was having people for very long periods of time, um, you know, three or four years on a part-time training course, you know, three to six months in a residential program on the other side of the world. So, you know, you can build in a lot of 
checks and balances and safety, but um, this is different, isn't it? You know, online stuff's different, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how do you make online training a um, accepted effort for people? Because, you know, we put it down in things that are similar to the credo in a way, the ground rules that were always called. But I guess there was just an assumption in Pelham, you'll be looked after, <laughs> okay? And I think people sort of knew that, you know, that was the ethos. But what if we're on other sides of the world, you know? <laughs> How do we keep that ethos going? Um, and again, that's, um, uh, you know, that's assessing goals, reaching a goal, um, and then assessing it and, okay, where are my goals now? At this age with coronavirus, um, the political hope, we said quietly. Um, yeah, what are my goals now? They're not the same as, you know, when I had program in Italy and training lots of people and all that, so it's different now. Um, so, and I, I think the triangle, <clears throat> you know, how, how to, because I've done it, it, it hadn't been conscious, but I've absolutely used accepted and rejected efforts and um, assessing goals to really make the lockdown for me. I have made it an accepted effort. Um, so I guess more than I, and the pendulum, uh, more than I sort of realize, I've sort of internalized the tools. Um, because as Vic was saying earlier, and I absolutely agree, somehow or other that's what David Pellin retrieved. Uh, uh, it wasn't an intellectual exercise, although that was the format. You know, he gave lectures. Um, but somehow he had a power of emotional communication that the stuff got inside you. Uh, I, I, I would like to say something, if I may, with a transparent preface that I struggled all morning with being a bit low and came out of it and I find I feel a bit chatty today. <laughs> but I think, I, 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 can I say the couple of things I was thinking? Peter, is that okay? Of course, of course it is. <laughs> well, sometimes you say, no, sit on the swing. <laughs> oh, no. That's me, uh, my worst, not my best. <laughs> well, I want, no, it's been very helpful. Don't uh, put that down. Um, I'm glad you don't think I need it today. <laughs> um, I wanted to say this is about accepted efforts and, uh, and, and starting something off. Um, I've been trying, I've been getting a book together about my husband's films pretty much from a few months after he died. And um, I hadn't done my bit and we're only waiting on one other, one other essay and mine work. And um, I had the, I, I knew I had to find a way to start. I have, I have got bits and pieces of starting that are better than I remembered I, when I looked, but I thought I've got to focus on this. So I just said, um, I'm going to do something every day, aiming for three hour sections, which I haven't managed to do very often uh, from August the 3rd, uh, just on weekdays, I can have the weekends off. And um, I really managed that. I wrote a story on Facebook group about the first day, how I did too much and put myself in a rejected effort. But every other day, I. I've done something every day, even if it's only been 20 minutes. And I, I, I think I'm uh, close to the actual writing now. 
and I'm quite excited. I'm quite excited about what I'm doing, and I'm excited about keeping in the accepted effort. And the other thing I wanted to say was just popped into my head uh, a new thought about something that happened the first time Peter and I met in a workshop, uh, because you said art therapy. And um, I don't know if you remember the first time you and I met was in the Churchill Centre in London. And um, we did an art therapy exercise, uh, and I wish I had this picture. I did a pastel drawing that was like, I thought like technically above the level I could achieve. Uh, it was just beautiful. And I re as far as I remember it, I just realized something about it that I'd never seen before, which was, it was a picture of my ex extremes, I believe. I think it was a picture of being high and getting depressed. That's what I seem to remember. And I went to do my first ever piece of hot seat work. And I got upset. Uh, somebody spoke to me and I rejected them. I got upset in the, uh, in the lunch break. And I sat down with all my experience of, of um, I sat down in the chair to work with all, this is relevant to safety, by the way, I'm not just going off in a completely diff different direction. Uh, with, all, with all my experience of primal therapy and things like that, we, and encounter groups where you just, if you had an uncomfortable feeling, you just went into the feeling. I sat down expecting that. And Peter said, imagine, you're back looking at the sun before this person spoke to you. In the other chair, he said that to me in the other chair. And I went from an agitated high to the calm of the pendulum in a second. And that was what hooked me to Pellin for the rest of my life because I was in a compulsive high and I went to the calm. Of course, I felt safe. I felt really safe that, that this amazing transformation had occurred. What I saw about the picture was that I was ready for that in a way I haven't quite realized. Peter said to me when I've asked about that first piece of work, he could hear in what I said I was ready to change about it. But I, didn't, I hadn't realized before that the picture was like a preparation for that change. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. It just really popped in and, and it, was, it was that safety of being held and taken into my own calm that I so rarely experienced that uh, the combination of the creativity and the inspiration and the safety was <laughs> what hooked me for life. So that just there we go. I've finished now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Joe, do you want to come in at all? Um, I was just thinking about what you had talked about, about um, goals and directions, really. Um, I did some NLP training last night that involved um, a method of going for goals. And I thought how interesting it would be tonight to apply those techniques to be thinking about directions rather than goals. So that's what I might do when we finish off. Okay. I think I, I'm thinking about, I, I noticed what you said, and oh, I'm sorry, did I come in a bad time? Cynthia. That's why I always wait. Go ahead, Cynthia. No, no. I, I'm not, I got nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, um, anyways, um, I was thinking about um, going back to when you did the, the, just even describing the goals, put a whole lot into place. Like one thing I noticed that it didn't contain anything about, oh, other people's expectations of you, uh, <laughs> what you, I mean, survival's important, but you know, all those other considerations. And when it was just, and it, it put a lot of 
it just, I, you wouldn't even do the exercise, just you talking about it just sort of shoved a lot of my triangles into a better place. So that was all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, when we, um, we, we, we talk about that, I think when I taught um, evaluating in terms of hurt and purpose here, I don't think I went into the part of it that's, you know, our own capacity to make an evaluation and other people's input, our own expectations of ourselves, other people's expectations of us. <clears throat> all, those, all those things sort of come in there, okay? They, they certainly have a place. So I, I think I would say that evaluating in terms of hurt and purpose it sort of takes in a whole bunch of stuff, okay? Um, yeah. And almost takes in as, as much stuff as we need to be able to make the evaluation from those two, point, those two points of view. One of my characters is um, her first husband was a Marine and her first lover, her first lesbian lover was a Marine. So I just think it's funny that she kind of married the same person. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's, that's some amazing sort of gestalt uh, type work. Um, you know, where do, when we write, where do the characters come from? Um, and I've developed a whole sort of genre, I think I'd like to call it, which I shared with Joe at another time, about writing fictional stories instead of case studies in my field of work, writing fictional stories. Um, I don't know where those characters come from. I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, and that, that's intriguing. Vic, would you like to say any more before we stop for this time? Sure, I'll just, <clears throat> I'll just share some thoughts. This is very spontaneous. I don't know how valid this are, but I was sitting here and I was thinking about this, this whole thing about goals goal orientation versus direction oriented. And I'm trying to think historically of the time that David was, you know, doing the activator unit and everything. And, and uh, Peter, and maybe everybody, but Peter in particular might be able to help me here. I think the, um, the big positive attitude, think and grow rich, set a goal, achieve it, whatever you can, you know, uh, whatever you can conceive, you can, whatever you can, conceive you can believe whatever you believe you can conceive and and this whole business of the of the goals um that david called himself you know a philosopher of human behavior the philosophy of goal setting was a big 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 deal in america and 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 then spreading out from the american hegemony right so the the business of setting goals is a big big deal and i was sitting here just now thinking that um you know setting the <clears throat> quote unquote big goals you know is a way people seek for control and power. And I'm not 100% sure, just I don't know that it's true in all cases, but I wonder if it's a way people seek for control and power uh, in their life, control over their life, which perhaps is an illusion. <laughs> Look at what COVID has done to our sense of control over our life, right? Um, and so I was wondering about that. And then I thought, you know, David's, concern he, he he had a concern about this and that's why he said direction you know we should be direction oriented not goal oriented and i'm thinking of direction a person uh, to me direction is more like a process and there are great philosophers i don't can't remember if it's bertrand russell or whatever who, who are called process philosophers you know um and the business of direction and if i if i link the word process i think a person's adjusting as they go and they're enjoying, and this is where the, the small triangle and the 
feelings mm -hmm. of accomplishment and turning the, the rejected effort into an accepted effort come into it if you can be more direction oriented it's a process you're going through and the goal maybe should be a way of fixing the direction rather than i've got to get there and when i arrive everything will be okay because when we arrive at the goal oftentimes we've we've heard it in our discussion today things are not necessarily okay um so i don't know you know for sure where that where that goes but david obviously he had a concern and i can remember being in the unit as a young 22 year old with a you know frazzled brain and everything else trying to sort myself out and I can remember hearing him teaching these things uh, and, and feeling, and Peter talked about this uh, power of David to emotionally teach, feeling this is important. This is important. I have to try to understand this. But to be honest with you, I'm still not sure I fully understand it, but I think it's also a historic perspective, you know, that, that there's a big giant fad that goes on, right? That the goal setting philosophy was a big deal in America. <clears throat> and maybe David was to a degree reacting to that and helping us. And uh, I don't know if that helps at all. That's, that's all. No, I, I, I appreciate that and it's relevant. And and because I have not thought about this part of him for um, a long time, but he did say, and it was a maybe I haven't wanted to think about it, uh, but he said, This is for now, okay? You know, the actuality of human philosophy is for this location in this time in history it's not for anything else i mean i couldn't handle that and i still can't but I, i've learned to um not push out things he taught me and when i got to when, when i got studied with flip clothes which is sort of a whole different thing you know he was famous david pelham was nobody um, and you know what you, I think I've said this before, but the whole thing, as you said, you know, there was the goal setting thing and then there was the other thing which was, uh, you know, don't push the river. There was a book of that title by a woman called Barry Stevens. Uh, you know, don't push the river, go with the flow. And I said to him, you know, I'm working, I'm working with the guys. If they don't push the river, they'll drown. Um, you know, so who you're working with, what the times are, we've got coronavirus, who, who knows where it's going. Um, so, and, and it's out of that to some extent that I developed the concept of tools. Um, because, and maybe it would develop the concept of tools almost in struggling with this question of, you know, how it's only relevant for the times. And then where the forum started, which I really want to get back to, you know, the, the concept of the Pelham lift and developing, you know, the pendulum, feelings of accomplishment, advisor, true rest, triangle accepted and rejected evidence and put together in some sort of neat, really accessible, really brief. I've done a little bit with what I call the Pelham workbooks. Um, so people can pick it up and lift it up. Um, you know, we've got things not good in England, um, but they're not that bad. But I mean, mums and dads in America, and you know whether you're gonna whether your kids are gonna go to school or not, and if you live in Texas or Arizona rather than Vermont or New York. Uh, but anyway, in terms of hurt and purpose, you're pretty heavy there, right? <laughs> um, so somehow or other, and maybe, maybe it is something about the whole assessment process, you know, what, what I'd like 
I have liked about today um, is the sort of looseness because I, I am thinking this through, but how we can have something that's sort of turning the triangle into something that's flexible and, you know, one of Michelangelo's tools, <clears throat> and then building in something that's about, yes, we need to make assessments. We're setting goals, but we still need to make assessments. Um, and, <clears throat> but within that and within the triangle, I do want, <coughs> I do want the survival kit, <clears throat> but at the same time, I want the dreaming kit, okay? Uh, so we can have um, the audacious goals. Um, because my, it's, a, it's something I've been a bit aware of in my life. So my first training was in, as an economist and economics is sort of called the dismal science. And then I got us into social work and psychotherapy, which is just focusing on problems, okay? I mean, you can't go and see a, a shrink unless you've got a problem. Uh, if, if you tell him you haven't got a problem, he'll turn that into a problem, guarantee. Um, so, you know, how do we take this restriction, find the wisdom that's in it, but not deny the world of, you know, uh, mom who, you know, got evicted, had to, um, you know, the only accommodation you have was a truck for nine months and she had two daughters, um, you know, got behind in rent, got behind in taxes, went to court, you know, Cory Bush is on her way to Congress, okay? Um, as a Congresswoman. So how do we fit these sort of lives into what we're doing, okay? Because we can't, I mean, stuff's a bit too rough. Um, we want the survival kit, but stuff's a bit too rough to say, well, you got the survival kit, that's all you're going to get. No, we've got to be able to have our dreams. Yeah. And David provided everything for that. I mean, his material on sustaining purpose, in my view, is untouchable. Anyway, uh, you yeah, know, anyway. Anyway. Um, I was just going to say, I was having a fantasy that you could adapt the uh, life goals exercise you just said to be a dreaming goals exercise. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> um, we're at, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go, Mary. I was only going to say, uh, we you were trying. You finished it up today. <laughs> okay. I was just going to say, we were trying to finish on time, so we should mm. start closing out. So, well, thank you for the invitation. So, um, I'm Mary, and I'm in Rosarito Beach, and I enjoyed saying as much as I have, so I won't add anything. <laughs> Okay. Um, let me go on gallery view so I can see. Right. Uh, Cynthia, do you want to close your... Hi, I'm Cynthia. I'm in Kankakee and I also said a lot today, so I'm at the <laughs> event. Um, jo? Um, I'm Jo Stanley in Yorkshire. I've really loved our diversity today. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jo. Stacey? I'm Stacy. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I just want to add that um, Elizabeth and Vic are very wise, and so is, so of course is Peter and Mary. That's kind of you, thanks. Yeah, Vic, you go next. Yeah, I'm Vic in uh, Abbotsford, British Columbia. Again, it's been a real pleasure connecting with you all. I really uh, appreciate that, and I appreciate uh, uh, Peter and team who put that together and I've said enough today too so thank you very much. Elizabeth. I'm Elizabeth. I'm 
still in Eugene. I'm short on sleep, and I have melted. Oh, get some rest, darling. <laughs> Okay, everyone. Well, thank you so much for coming. And I don't know if Shelley had an appointment or uh, lost her connection, but she's in Woodland Hills, California. My neighbour as was. <laughs> and um, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye bye. bye, -bye. And Peter bye -bye. will.